Oral questions. Question orale, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Monsieur le Président, le ministre. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Defence was aware of allegations of sexual misconduct against General Vance in 2018. The Clerk of the Privy Council was aware. The Prime Minister's senior advisor knew it. The Prime Minister's Chief of Staff knew it. Was the Prime Minister also aware? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I've said for a long time, yes, there was a complaint against General Vance, but there was no one in my office or in Minister Sajan's office who knew the nature of the complaint. Of course, Mr. Speaker, we need to improve processes. We need to ensure that we can create an environment in which people who have complaints uh, feel supported to come forward. That is always what we will try to ensure. The, shift. the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of National Defence was aware of sexual misconduct allegations against General Advance in 2018. The Clerk of the Privy Council was aware. The Senior Advisor, Mr. Marquez, to the Prime Minister was aware. The Chief of Staff to the Prime Minister was aware in 2018. Mr. Speaker, was the Prime Minister aware of sexual misconduct allegations in 2018? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, what the Leader of the Opposition is putting forward is simply untrue. While there was awareness that there was a complaint against General Vance, there was no awareness that it was, in fact, a Me Too complaint of a sexual nature. Uh, these are issues uh, that we have continued to work on seriously as a government. And I need to highlight that the leader of the official opposition had heard a rumor, rumor of misconduct back in 2015, told his staff, who then told PMO, and they told the Privy Council office. It is the exact same process that played out in 2015 under the previous Conservative government as played out in our government, but we, Mr. Speaker, have taken far more actions to change the culture for the better of our military. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Let's explore those actions, Mr. Speaker. For months, the Prime Minister he has said he was not aware of specific allegations. Today, he just told the House that his office was not aware that they were of a Me Too nature, Mr. Speaker. The only trouble is his team used the term sexual harassment in their emails about this incident in March 2018, Mr. Speaker. Will the Prime Minister be honest with this House and with the women serving bravely in our Canadian Armed Forces that he was aware and he failed them for three years? Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, as a government, we have consistently stood up uh, for survivors, uh, stood up against harassment uh, and intimidation in federal workplaces across the country and indeed uh, in the Canadian Armed Forces. We have made significant investments in improving uh, systems and accountability, and we will continue to do that. Uh, in 2015, when a complaint came, complaint came forward, uh, we forwarded that uh, to uh, the, the uh, Privy Council Office so that they could do the follow-up necessary. But Unfortunately, the Ombudsman uh, was not able to reveal the full extent because he didn't have permission. We need to create a system in which people feel supported to come forward. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is now using the term we, so I take it that he was aware in 2018 <laughs> that his office was emailing with Mr. Walburn with respect to sexual harassment. Does the Prime Minister in the House of Commons suggest that Canadian women, when they ref use the term Me Too, are not referring to sexual harassment? Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister and his team were aware. Why did he cover it up? Here, here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the very beginning of my leadership, from my beginning as a time as Prime Minister, I have consistently stood up uh, to defend people who are facing, allegations, facing situations of misconduct uh, or sexual harassment, and I have always done that every step of the way, and my office has always taken that just as seriously. We will always stand with survivors. We will always ensure uh, justice and support for them every step of the way. Uh, you need simply to look at our record, and we will continue continue to do even more to do just that.
Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I am looking at the records from his office when they used the term sexual harassment, yet today the Prime Minister maybe has new notes now, Mr. Speaker, is suggesting they didn't think it was a Me Too allegation. His own team was describing it as sexual harassment, Mr. Speaker. The Privy Council clerk knew. The, the Chief of Staff. I, I'm going to interrupt. We'll, we'll, we'll let the Honourable Member start his question over. I'll just check to see what the point of order is. Uh, the Honourable Member for. We have a, quite a number of. We have quite a number. Of, we'll start with the Honourable Member from Abbotsford, who's at the top of the list. The Chamber's on mute, Mr. Speaker. We can't okay. hear the Chamber virtually. Okay. What? Okay, we'll just. Just test. Can everyone hear? Very good. We'll return to the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Start Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It seems with this cover-up, the country's been on mute with respect to these allegations for three years. So, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister knows that his own office was using the term sexual harassment with respect to this allegation in 2018. All of the senior members of his office knew and used the term sexual harassment. So it's embarrassing to suggest that he wasn't aware that it was a Me Too style complaint. Mr. Speaker, the Clerk of the Privy Council knew, his senior advisor, the Chief of Staff to the Prime Minister of Canada knew for three years. Why did she lie to him? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, my office and my Chief of Staff specifically has from the very beginning always taken extraordinarily seriously any allegations of personal and professional misconduct, particularly uh, allegations of a sexual nature. Uh, we have consistently stood up in defence of survivors, consi consistently pushed back against cultures that tolerate and accept uh, marginalisation or diminishment of women uh, or other minorities. Uh, that is something that we will continue to stand up for. We will continue to defend uh, anyone who comes forward with stories of allegations uh, and allegations of misconduct. Uh, that is what this government has always stood for. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said yesterday, when it comes to the Port of Montreal, a special legislation is not a solution. Rather, it's a proof of incompetence. In five minutes on the telephone, the Prime Minister could have avoided this strike. The union said clearly that if the employer would uh, compromise on the ships, that there would not be a strike. So the Prime Minister could have called to make that happen. So will the Prime Minister, or rather can the Prime Minister, avoid serious economic losses at the Port of Montreal and avoid this special legislation by picking up the phone? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we often hear the Bloc rise in the House to talk about the fact that they're going to interest, uh, defend the interests of Quebecers. Well, here's an opportunity for them to move from uh, talk to action, but they're not going to do that. So will they really support our bill, which would allow for the resumption of activities at the Port of Montreal and would set up a mediation process, a neutral mediation process to resolve the uh, problems and lead to a new collective agreement? Yes or no? Well, I'm sure the answer is no. They won't take action on behalf of Quebecers. The Honourable Member for belle Chambly. Mr. Speaker, can you tell the Prime Minister that it's not, this is not a question of parties, Liberal or Bloc, this is a question of the Port of Montreal. He just needs to pick up the phone. Rather than saying that he's, rather than acting like a Conservative dressed in red, he should actually consider the workers' interests. He should pick up the phone, take five minutes and avoid the strike. This is going to cost thirty to fifty thousand dollars for people who use the Port of Montreal. So why won't why didn't he just call the employer to fix the problem? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, this is nonsense. For years, we have been encouraging negotiation at the table. We have been encouraging the different parties to reach a common agreement. They didn't manage. It's only at the very end of the process that uh, 
we've seen we're going to be dealing with very serious consequences, not only for the Quebec economy, but for Quebecers as well. So that's why we need to intervene to force mediation. We need to force a neutral, uh, neutral arbitration that will find a solution. The Bloc has an opportunity to, to support this bill. Will they do it? Apparently not. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Workers at the Port of Montreal want to have a collective agreement, and that's their right. But instead of helping them, the Prime Minister will force them to return to work. The President of the Union wrote to the Prime Minister saying that this type of legislation would infringe on workers' rights. Will the Prime Minister listen to the demands of the workers and withdraw this back-to-work legislation? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, for years now, we have been encouraging and ensuring that those negotiations happen at the negotiating table between the employer and the employees. It's the role of the government to do that, and that's what we did. Now, we've reached a point where the negotiations are, are breaking down. We're at risk of harming not only uh, Quebec and Canada's economy, but thousands of uh, citizens as well. So yes, we're going to take action, not to impose a contract on anyone, but to allow for neutral arbitration that will lead to a new agreement. For Burnaby South. The most vulnerable people in our society continue to be those who get sick and end up dying. Experts agree that improving the federal paid sick leave program will save lives. But the Prime Minister seems content to just sit on the sidelines and not do anything to improve it. Government's uh, own forecasts show that they're sitting on over $4 billion of unspent money on their federal paid sick leave program. So why won't the Prime Minister stop sitting on the sidelines, show leadership, improve the paid sick leave program, and save lives? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we did move forward with a federal uh, emergency sick leave as of last year uh, for two weeks uh, at $500 a week, and we added another two weeks. The challenge, Mr. Speaker, is uh, the best paid sick leave is that that goes through employers. And we're working right now, uh, uh, the Minister of Finance is working with the province of Ontario to help them bring in uh, sick leave through their employers. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, we brought in federally regulated employer sick leave in September of 2019. Unfortunately, the NDP had voted against it in 2018, Mr. Speaker. Honorable... The Honourable Member for Chico de Millefior. Mr. Speaker, well, many countries are in the process of coming out of lockdown, in Canada things are very different. We're locking down again. Curfews are in effect and hospitals are overflowing. Why are we in this situation? because we're struggling to get vaccines. Only 3% of Canadians have received their two doses. Yet the Prime Minister says that he wouldn't change anything when it comes to his handling of the pandemic, despite the fact that there were many things that he could have done to prevent this tragedy. Will the Prime Minister admit that, unlike what he says, he could have gotten vaccines on time? The Honourable Minister. Monsieur le... Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives' narrative here omits a number of facts. Vaccine uh, production was increasing in January and February. We exceeded our uh, first quarter projections. We are third out of G20 countries when it comes to administering vaccines. So we need a multifaceted approach in order to fight the virus. Vaccines. A PPE and health protocols. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi de Fjord. Mr. Speaker, a stable and predictable vaccine supply, increased border control, and sufficient rapid testing are just a few of the things that the Prime Minister could have done differently. And speaking of things he could have done better, the budget. In the midst of a pandemic, he was unable to provide stable, predictable, unconditional health transfers to the provinces, even though that was their main request. How can he explain his reckless spending, but then when it comes time to helping provinces with their health, he's, he's, uh, he's stingy? The Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, every step of the way. We've indeed been there for Quebec, like all provinces and territories, whether it was the $19 billion Safe Restart Fund, Mr. Speaker, additional money for mental health and addiction support, Mr. Speaker, whether it was purchasing all of the PPE, all of the therapeutics, all of the testing, Mr. Speaker, indeed, all of the vaccines. We've been there for Quebec and for Quebecers, and we will not hesitate to be there until we get through this together. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister's statement to the media today regarding what he knew about the nature of the allegations against General Vance contradicts everything we've heard so far. Multiple witnesses have testified at Defence Committee that the allegations were sexual misconduct. The Prime Minister's staff were copied on emails from the Privy Council office that specifically stated sexual harassment. Does the Prime Minister really expect Canadians to believe he knew nothing about the allegations against General Vance? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government um, has absolutely no tolerance against any type of misconduct. And something that uh, we have focused on. Mr. Speaker, I find it rich that the um, leader of the official opposition and member opposite are bringing this issue up. When the leader of the opposition knew of issues like this with General Vance, but the previous government made the selection to select General Vance as CDS anyway. Mr. Speaker, we will take bold action for culture change. We have a lot more work to do and we will get it done. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Well, Mr. Speaker, actions speak louder than words. The Prime Minister may say that he stands for women, but his actions show that he's part of the problem, not part of the solution. His chief of staff knew about the allegations of sexual misconduct against General Vance. His defense minister knew. The entire senior leadership of his department knew, but he did nothing for three years. Why did the Prime Minister fail to act on allegations of sexual misconduct at the highest level in Canada's military? Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Sorry, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in this matter, we followed a process that had been laid out by the previous government. I instructed my chief of staff to get in touch with PMO and the Privy Council Office, and they in turn to launch and look into this matter. And a similar path was done in 2015, again, as I stated, Mr. Speaker, by the leader of the, of the opposition. In terms of taking action, M Mr. Speaker, we have outlined additional $236 million to combat uh, sexual misconduct in, in the Canadian Armed Forces. We are taking real action. We know that one more work needs to be done, and we will get it done. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Mr. Speaker, just as other countries are beating us when it comes to vaccinating their citizens, they're also beating us by giving their economies a shot in the arm. The UK is investing in a massive infrastructure revolution. Italy is unveiling the mother of all regulatory reforms. And France and Germany are cutting taxes. What did Canada's recent budget do? Run up generational debt while neglecting strategic investments for long-term growth. Why is this government setting up our economy for post-pandemic failure? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, with respect to my friend, his argument is self-defeating. On the one hand, he says we should be spending more. On the other, he says we should be spending too much. The reality is we've made target investments from the very beginning of this pandemic to make sure that businesses could keep their doors open and have workers remain on the payroll. Going forward, our recovery plan is making continued target investments to ensure more women can take part in the economy, to make sure young people have an opportunity to take part in the economy. And yes, it will also invest in infrastructure to create jobs and communities from coast to coast to coast. Canadians can rest assured we have had their backs from the beginning and we won't take our foot off the gas until this recovery is complete. Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Mr. Speaker, unfortunately for Canadians, this budget will not deliver economic growth. The growth we will see is not build back better. It's build back bigger, bigger debt, bigger deficits, bigger spending, bigger government. And with inflation around the corner, Higher interest rates and higher taxes are a real worry for families who can't afford housing or struggle with debt. Why does this Liberal government not see the harm it's causing to ordinary Canadians? Uh, we had a little bit of a technical glitch. Normally, if you can hear the question, but I believe the question kind of uh, 
it, uh, it had a little bit of a jitter there. Uh, I'll ask the Honourable Member for Ab Abbotsford to ask the whole question again, please. Mr. Speaker, fortunately, unfortunately for Canadians, this budget will not deliver economic growth. The growth we will see is not build back better. It's build back bigger, bigger debt, bigger deficits, bigger spending, bigger government. And with inflation around the corner, higher interest rates and higher taxes are a real worry for families who can't afford housing or struggle with debt. Why does this Liberal government not see the harm it's causing to Canadian families? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, with great respect, if the Honourable Member is worried we'll build back bigger, I can reassure him that we will big back, build back with bigger growth. We will build back with bigger prosperity. We will build back with bigger jobs numbers. The Chief Economist at RBC has described the upcoming year as one of profound economic recovery. The reality is we have put measures in place that are going to support Canadians through this pandemic and set the stage for a recovery that is robust, sustainable and inclusive. If the Honourable Member can't get on board with that plan, then I'd suggest he revisit things. The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, on August 17th, Quebec's economy and labour ministers wrote to Ottawa demanding that the federal government work toward a negotiated solution at the Port of Montreal. They asked federal ministers to exercise their leadership in order to facilitate a resolution. What did the federal government do for eight months to exercise leadership before it came up with this special legislation? How many times did the minister meet with the parties? How many times did Ottawa publicly call for a resolution? Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the reality here we're talking about jobs, economic stability, the reputation of the Port of Montreal, and the economy of Quebec as a whole. So we need to take action. If the Bloc Québécois doesn't want to help, they should at least get out of the way and let us do the work, because we need to get this uh, moving again. The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, here we're talking about leadership. And if there had been some real leadership, we would have gotten things moving again. But when it was time to do the work, the Minister of Labour had already thrown in the towel. More than a month ago, according to La Presse, the Minister was already planning to use special legislation and had presented an emergency plan to Cabinet. So what real effort has the Minister made in the past month to resolve the conflict? And what incentive did the parties have to come to an agreement, knowing that the federal government had already announced that it would be introducing the special legislation. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the very beginning, we have been working here, encouraging dialogue, trying to find a common solution, but now we need to take action. And for, for one time here, the Bloc Québécois could make a real difference. Rather than just talking, 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 they could actually make a real difference uh, by supporting the government's efforts and the Quebec government's efforts as well to uh, get the port reopened. People are asking us for action, including the Quebec government. So can they not see the consensus in Quebec? Can they not defend the interests of Quebec here? Or do they just want to abandon Quebecers? The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, we had quite a uh, turnaround last Friday at the Heritage Committee when we were considering Bill C-10 on broadcasting and the Broadcasting Act. Against all odds, the Liberals, with no warning, removed a significant section of the bill that will allow the CRTC to regulate social networks without any clear direction on how that power should be used. We all know that the, the Liberals don't like being criticized, but why would they want to attack the freedoms of uh, internet users on social networks. The Honourable uh, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to read some of the extracts from debates in the House uh, from November 2020. The member opposite was criticizing Bill C-10. He said, but this isn't in the bill and nothing would allow us to regulate social media or platforms, platforms like YouTube. So I don't understand. One day the Conservatives say that we need to regulate 
uh, platforms like YouTube, and the next day they say, no, 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 let's not regulate. So does can the Conservative of Party of Canada make up its mind? The Honourable Member for Richmond, Athabasca. Mr. Speaker, this minister really likes to take things out, out of context. What the Liberals are not saying is that we need to listen to experts. But here is what Michael Geist said. He's a uh, professor emeritus from the University of Ottawa. He said, it's hard to understand the level of hubris or incompetence that would lead someone to believe that such an encroachment on rights is justified. He said, it undermines uh, fundamental democratic rights. So what does the um, minister have to say to these experts who are saying that this is an attack on people's rights? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the member for Richmond North Damascus didn't answer his own uh, quotation here, asking us to intervene. It just doesn't make any sense. We've always said that users of platforms would be excluded. That's exactly what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. So platforms that act as broadcasters would not be su subject to this regulation. That's what we've said from the very beginning, and that's what we're doing. For Lethbridge, please lower your mic. Uh, there we go. Perfect. I'm afraid uh, the honourable member's on mute. Uh, oh, we're not hearing a thing. I look over to the technical folks if they can make out what it is. Maybe check on the bottom corner. There's two places to mute, sometimes on the headset itself and sometimes on the program. My apologies. Thank you. Very good. <clears throat> the Honourable Member. The Minister is misleading the House. Amendments are being proposed that change this legislation from what it was in the fall. The current government has shown an ever-increasing disregard for the rights and freedoms of Canadians. Under Bill C-10, they are now wanting to amend the Broadcasting Act to allow for government censorship of video content on social media. According to the Minister, it's all about restricting content that, quote, undermines Canada's social cohesion. But what does that even mean? Soon, they'll create Ministry of Truth, which just sounds like a weird call, let's be honest. So why is the Prime Minister trampling on the rights and freedoms of Canadians? And why is this minister choosing to mislead Canadians? Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think the member opposite is, is very confused because Bill C-10 is about the Broadcasting Act that has nothing to do with, with online harms, which is another bill that will be introduced. And I'm, I am confused because... Conservative Party of Canada has asked us a number of times to intervene so that we can prevent online child pornography, which is exactly what we want to do. So are they saying that they're, they're opposed to us trying to act on that, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Member for Lethbridge. Again, the Minister is trying to mislead Canadians. It's incredibly inappropriate and damaging. This is a quote. It's difficult to contemplate the levels of moral hubris, incompetence, or both that would lead people to believe such infringement of rights is justifiable. End quote. That's what the former commissioner of the CRTC had to say. Government control over user-generated content and apps is a complete violation of our charter rights. It is this kind is this the kind of country that the Prime Minister is trying to quote reimagine? And if so, then when will he reimagine a free society where our charter rights are respected? Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And unfortunately, it's the member opposite who's trying to mislead Canadians. We've said from the beginning, uh, when we introduced Bill C-10, that user-generated content would be excluded, uh, but that online platforms would, who act as, as broadcasters would be included in the legislation. This is exactly what the amendments that have been debated in the committee are trying to do, and that's what we will do, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for New Westminster, Burnaby. This government has encouraged unbelievable profiteering during this pandemic. Canada's billionaires have increased their wealth by over $78 billion, yet this government refuses to follow the lead of other countries and put in place a wealth tax. Now the Parliamentary Budget Officer has released new figures on how much a pandemic profits tax would bring. It's $8 billion, more than enough to put a roof over every Canadian's head and eliminate homelessness in Canada. Yet Liberals refuse yet again to curb profiteering. Why do Liberals always give a free ride to the ultra-rich? The Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, let me correct the record. I'll remind the honorable member that in 2015, when we raised taxes on the wealthiest 1% so we could cut them for the middle class, the NDP voted against it. When we implemented the Canada Child Benefit and improved finances for nine out of 10 families and stopped sending childcare checks to millionaires, the NDP voted against it. When we increase investments in the CRA to combat tax evasion, the NDP voted against it. The budget includes measures that will support vulnerable Canadians and does not ask uh, and will ask the wealthy Canadians to pay more. I trust the NDP will buck the historical trend and support the budget when they have the opportunity. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Mr. Speaker, this government is almost two years late releasing a national action plan to uphold the calls to justice of the National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls. And what do we see? Internal emails showing a continuation of a fragmented, uncoordinated response by the RCMP, a failure to address call to justice 9.5. COVID is not an excuse. Indigenous women and girls, 2S LGBTQIA individuals, continue to go missing and murdered. When will this government release a national action plan to stop this ongoing genocide? Honorable Minister. I thank the, minister, the member for the question. And as always, our hearts are with the survivors, the families, and the missing and murdered Indigenous women, two spirit and gender diverse people, and they're helping us develop the best possible uh, effective and accountable national action plan. In the response to the first ever national public inquiry on this ongoing national tragedy, our government is working with all provincial and territorial governments, as well as Indigenous leaders, survivors, and families to develop that national action plan that will set a clear roadmap to ensure that Indigenous women and girls and two-spirited people are, are safe wherever they live. And the Honourable Member for Avalon. Mr. Speaker, did you know that 90% of Canadian seafood goes through small craft harbours and Canada's fish harvesters depend on these facilities to support their livelihoods? Well, my constituents do. Small craft harbours in my riding are the lifeblood of rural communities and industry hubs for shipping, trade, fishing, recreation and other marine sectors. Can the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans tell us what our government is doing to invest in small craft harbours? Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my honourable colleague for the question and also for his hard work with regards to his advocacy for fisheries and seafood workers uh, right across the country. Mr. Speaker, um, 7 million people live in our rural coastal communities, and we know how important our small craft harbours are to our communities. That's why our government is investing $300 million through Budget 2021 to make sure that we can renew and revitalize these small craft harbours that are so critical to our coastal communities. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to be part of a government that recognizes how important this is to rural Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For Edmonton Centre. Mr. Speaker, last week this government made more big promises on how they're going to retrain workers and get them back to work in droves. Yet they haven't told us what jobs these will be, who will employ them, or how long that retraining will take. Can the minister please tell us what specific jobs Canadians are being reskilled for? Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The nature of work and the way businesses operate are indeed changing at an ever-increasing speed. That's why in Budget 2021, we are investing nearly $2.5 billion to help employers train and reskill people, help workers transition to new jobs, enhance foundational and transferable skills, and create a new apprenticeship service for the trades. We are creating 500,000 new training work opportunities, including 215,000 new job and training opportunities for youth, supporting businesses in the most affected sectors, such just tourism and arts and culture, and accelerating investments in digital transformation of small and medium-sized businesses. This is how we're putting our government on track to meet our commitment to create a million jobs by the end of this year. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Centre. Mr. Speaker, well, that was all over the map. And I'll give a little advice. There's numerous energy projects across this country awaiting approval. Now, these are real projects, real jobs. Thousands of them, thousands of them in fact, are shovel-ready and employ those who already have the skills. Now, while we're waiting for the government's great master plan to reskill Canadians, can we at least get these Canadians back to work? 
now. Honorable Minister. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, that's why we're investing in sectors and communities and specific um, job transitions. We're inv investing in young people. We're investing in people with disabilities. We have a comprehensive plan that's not scattered or all over the map. It's just comprehensive. And perhaps the Conservatives haven't seen such a plan before. We're creating jobs. We're, we're training and upskilling workers. And we will continue to be there for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Mr. Speaker, Greg runs an auto service business in Calgary that opened in late 2019, just before uh, COVID, and does not qualify for assistance. This government's continuing failure to deliver vaccines and rapid results screening tests uh, to safely reopen the economy means that more and more businesses are at risk of failing, and the ones that were brand new when the pandemic hit are among the worst affected. The budget contains nothing for these businesses that are still denied support because they opened just before COVID. Why? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for the question. We have made a number of supports to help businesses from the very beginning, whether it's programs like the Wage Subsidy, the Regional Relief and Recovery Fund, or the Emergency Business Account. We realize that there continues to be challenges for certain businesses, but we've made investments to ensure that their communities can open up safely and are continuing to make investments, as he mentioned, in vaccines, and we've now seen more than 13.8 million doses delivered directly to the provinces. We're going to continue to work to find solutions to support business businesses to make sure that they're here on the back end of this pandemic so the recovery will help the economy come roaring back. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Well, there's nothing in that answer that will help Greg's business. I raised this issue in a question period in February. The Parliamentary Secretary for Small Business said that they were working on it. I raised the issue at Finance in March and the Deputy Prime Minister admitted that they have failed businesses like Greg's. There's been a speech from the throne, a fall economic statement uh, and finally a budget and there's still nothing. They've admitted that there is a problem. That's the first step. When will they actually do something? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are very aware of this situation. I want to thank my colleague for raising the important issue. When we create an emergency relief program, our government sought to support as many Canadian businesses as possible, as quickly as possible. At the same time, we know that all of these programs needed to be designed so we can also ensure their integrity as we ensure they're reaching as many businesses as is humanly possible. This can be a very challenging balance to strike, and we're working to find that balance so we can support new businesses, as well as those millions who've already received support. L'honorable député de Pierre Boucher. The honorable member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères. Mr. Speaker, in this morning's edition of La Presse, the CEO of CN says the impact of the strike at the Port of Montreal won't be as bad as feared because we've all seen this coming for weeks. Businesses have rerouted their cargo to other ports like Halifax, and shipping routes have been altered. Everyone's just waiting for the dispute to degenerate. I'll, I'm just going to interrupt the Honourable Member. We seem to be having a technical problem. I'd ask him to start his question over because we missed part of it. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères. Mr. Speaker, in this morning's edition of La Presse, the CEO of CN says the impact of the strike at the Port of Montreal won't be as bad as feared because we've all seen this coming for weeks. Businesses have rerouted their cargo to other ports like Halifax and shipping routes have been altered. Everyone's just waiting for the dispute to degenerate ever since the federal government indicated a month ago that it was prepared to table back to work legislation. Why have they completely abdicated leadership in favor of sitting back and waiting for the talks to fail? Where where has the Prime Minister been? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we've been there from the beginning. Uh, as far back as two and a half years ago, we've been helping the parties to negotiate. There have been a hundred sessions with the federal negotiator, and there's a consensus in Quebec, the government of Quebec and Ottawa and economic circles. Everyone wants uh, workers and families. Everybody agrees we need to protect the economy and we need to move forward. The bloc has an opportunity here, an opportunity to stand up and pitch in and help us move forward. But no, they won't do that. They just want to play partisan politics here. It's time to get rid of the bloc in Quebec. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères. Well, 
every time this government's involved in a dispute, it degenerates into an economic crisis. Last year, the labor dispute at CN was allowed to drag, drag on until the propane shortage put farmers' crops at risk. They let the wet so wet and crisis get so bad, the Prime Minister even recommended setting in the police to break up Indigenous protesters. And today, they're watching the talks at the Port of Montreal and waiting for a deadlock to introduce back-to-work legislation. Is it really too much to ask for the Prime Minister to try governing? The Honourable Minister, look, uh, why don't they stand up for Quebec instead of just grumbling and picking quarrels? We're talking about economic stability here. The reputation of the Port of Montreal and Montreal itself are at stake. This is of huge economic importance. The Bloc should listen to the government of Quebec, to economic circles, to families and workers and everyone who's worried. If the Bloc isn't willing to help, they should get out of the way and we'll do the job on behalf of the Quebec economy. It's time to unblock Quebec. Mr. Kenyon. Mr. Speaker, home ownership is becoming impossible for Canadians to attain, a trend that has only grown exponentially worse over the course of the pandemic. The stats back this up. Korea reports that the national average home price rose 31.6% compared to March of last year. Why has the Liberal government's 2021 budget completely ignored first-time home buyers and the housing needs of young Canadians? Honourable Minister. It's very good to see the Conservatives finally talk about housing. I remember a Prime Minister called Stephen Harper who told me once as a reporter to go read the Constitution because housing wasn't a federal responsibility. But let me assure the member opposite that not only will we be taking steps to invest in first-time buyers and supporting them cross the bridge to home ownership, not only will we invest the $75 billion in a national housing strategy to make rent more affordable, not only will we put a tax on foreign speculators in the Canadian housing market, we are not done yet. There are new steps to be taken. We believe in making sure Canadians have a choice and when that choice should be safe and affordable and secure. We will get this done. We will not take advice from the Conservatives who are missing in action for 10 years. The Honourable Member for Mission Metzke, Fraser Canyon. And Mr. Speaker, I would take no advice from the member opposite who believes that foreign buyers have a better ac accessibility to purchasing a home in Canada than a young Canadian. I could go all day about the failures of this government to address young home buyers. The new housing program doesn't e hasn't even made the changes yet to address the rising house prices in Vancouver. Why is this government failing young Canadians? Why is this government losing hope for young Canadians who just want to secure your place to raise their family. Honourable Minister. You know, it's funny, the party opposite misunderstands identifying a problem with being happy about that situation. The issue was described as a serious issue, and as in the budget we just tabled, we are taking steps to address it. We're also taking steps to address money laundering. We're also taking steps to strengthen FinTrack to make sure that foreign speculation does not distort the housing market and protects Canadians. Our job as a government is to get, build a housing system based on our human rights approach that gives Canadians the choice whether they want to rent or own, and to support that choice with programs that facilitate the realization of that dream. The party opposite, not only were they missing an action, they might want to take a look at their role in English Income trust and what role that's playing in the distortion of the housing market. Might have a few words the Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, exports are responsible for one in five jobs in Canada and nearly a third of our GDP. Robust trade not only provides economic security for families and businesses, but will help reduce our massive federal debt. Despite being critical to our economic recovery, trade appears to be an afterthought in the budget. This isn't a surprise. The same government missed the deadline to implement the trade continuity agreement with the UK and still has not negotiated a Buy America exemption. Why did the government fail to make trade a priority in its recent budget? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm happy to take this question because only a few weeks ago, Canada ranked number two in the entire world in terms of foreign direct investment attractiveness. We take our exporters very seriously in this country. They are an integral part of our economy and will form an integral part of our economic relaunch. We are certainly going to continue supporting our exporters. And when it comes to having their backs, this government has consistently been there for them, as we will continue to be through the other side of this pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dorval, Lachine, LaSalle. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, our government tabled Budget 2021. It's one of the most important budgets in generations. It's a plan to invest in students, young people, families, and vulnerable people from coast to coast to coast. Beyond the pandemic, job creation will be a key feature of our economics recovery. Could the Minister of Employment, Workforce Development and Disability Inclusion tell the House what this government is doing to bring the number of jobs in Canada back to their pre-pandemic level? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Dorval, Lachine LaSalle, for her advocacy on behalf of her constituents. Mr. Speaker, our budget is a plan that invests in growth for all Canadians and an economic recovery that leaves no one behind. We're investing close to $2.5 billion to help train and reskill workers and help Canadians transition to new jobs. We're also creating 500,000 new training and employment opportunities, including 215,000 opportunities for young people. In addition, we're extending the wage subsidy and creating the Canada Recovery Hiring Program to help businesses hire and retain workers. Mr. Speaker, we hope we're on, we are on track to keep our commitment to create a million jobs by the end of the year. Mm. The Minister of Finance has stated, because interest rates are low, Canada can afford this massive debt and enormous endless deficits. She seems oblivious to the fact that interest rates have nowhere to go but up. Finance Minister Paul Martin stated that, and I quote, the debt and the deficit are not inventions of ideology. They are facts of arithmetic. The quicksand of compound interest is real, end quote. Mr. Speaker, future generations who have to pay this massive debt want to know if Paul Martin was wrong or the current minister. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, there is no question that the emergency measures we put forward to support Canadians during an unprecedented public health and economic crisis have been expensive, but doing too little would have been far more expensive. I'd point the honourable member to the report of the IMF that indicates had we not put forward these measures, our deficit would be of the same scale, but our economy would have experienced economic scarring that would have hamstrung our recovery for a generation. I'd point the honourable member as well to the recent reaffirmation of our AAA investment Grade credit rating from the major credit rating agencies. It turns out those socialists at the credit rating agencies also believe that supporting families during their time of need and keeping workers on the... The Honourable Honorable... The Honourable Member for Bose. Mr. Speaker, the government has failed on another file, foreign workers. They awarded a sole source contract to a unilingual English-speaking company in Toronto for all their COVID tests. There's a business in my riding that's been waiting 19 days now for something that's only supposed to take 14 days. For five days, my constituent has been trying in vain to get through to somebody. I know the minister is going to tell me they've signed another contract, but that doesn't solve the problem for those who are still waiting on Switch Health. What does the minister have to say to businesses in my riding? The Honourable Minister. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, all federal departments have worked together to accelerate the entry of all foreign temporary workers, and we have launched a new partnership with Dynacare to facilitate uh, COVID tests for temporary foreign workers arriving by plane. And base, as of April 8th, services, support services will be dedicated in Eng Eng English and French and other languages. This agreement will help meet the increased demand for tests in the months to come. The Honourable Member for Levy lobinière Mr. Speaker, temporary workers have been delayed coming to Canada and reaching firms in Quebec. They're still waiting for supposedly rapid test results from a company that, in addition to being slow, only operates in English. Mr. Speaker, precious time wasted and flagrant disrespect from this government for our French-speaking farmers in Quebec. What's the government going to do to accelerate the process for those already waiting and to serve Francophones properly? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I just said, as of April 28th, Dynacare will be offering temporary foreign workers 
uh, dedicated support services in French, English, and other languages. This agreement will help meet the increased demand in the months to come and support essential sectors like agriculture and protect the health and safety of temporary foreign workers as well as Canadians. For Brampton South. Mr. Speaker, Brampton has been one of the hardest hit communities by the pandemic in Ontario. We have been on lockdown since November. Right now we have a test positivity rate of 22% and the situation remains difficult. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Finance tell this House how Budget 2021 will help hotspots like Brampton get through the pandemic and help the community to recover once this pandemic is over? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my Honourable Colleague for her question and for her ongoing advocacy for the people of Brampton. The uptick that we've seen in case numbers in her community and frankly across parts of the country is deeply concerning. I point to the fact that we've invested billions of dollars now to expand EI sickness benefits and implement the Canada Recovery Sickness Benefit so families don't need to choose between earning a paycheck and protecting their health. We've now implemented over 13.8 million doses of vaccines in Canadian communities and we're continuing to make investments like through the Safe Restart Agreement with nearly $19 billion to make sure that Canadians can return to work. As we go forward, we're going to continue to support Canadians in their time of need and ensure that their health and well-being is their first priority. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. The Housing Parliamentary Secretary admitted that Canada is, quote, a very safe market for foreign investment, but not a great market for Canadians looking for choices around housing. He also said that Canada's housing market is, quote, driven by speculation. The cost of housing in Canada has increased by 31 percent over the last year alone. This 1 percent vacant homes tax for non-Canadians living outside of Canada is not going to cut it. Will the government increase this tax, bring it a foreign buyer's tax and put in new money for the construction of social housing for those in core need. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, having just heard the NDP House Leader talk about solving the housing crisis with an $8 billion investment, I'm a little reluctant to take the advice of the NDP on housing policy. Uh, after all, they've already spent that money on pharmacare, fighting climate change, basic income. I'm not sure quite for how far one simple tax will stretch. But the issue is this. We are focused on delivering housing to Canadians that they can afford, that's safe and that's secure. We're working on rental housing. We're working on first-time home buyers. We're working on making sure the market is regulated back to shape so that foreign investors don't find a home before Canadians do, because our goal is to get every Canadian a home. That's what the National Housing Strategy is investing in. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Climate targets aren't about politics, they're about science. And even though Canada has improved our target last week at Biden's climate summit, we are not aligned with the science. Speaker after speaker at that summit made it clear that we must achieve the bulk of reductions this decade if we're going to hold to 1.5 degrees. So my question to the government is, Will this minister, will the prime minister be open to changing Bill C-12 with a specific target due on 2025 baked into the bill? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we support enhanced reporting to ensure we're on track to meeting our newly announced national determined, determined contributions for 2030. To this end, we have proposed embedding Canada's new target for 2030 directly into the Act, which is 40 to 45 percent below 2005 emission levels. Mr. Speaker, climate change is an urgent issue and we must work together on it. We hope that the Green Party will support the bill at second reading so that we can continue to work constructively to further strengthen the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 